So thank you for the opportunity to present at this meeting. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person, uh, but hopefully you'll find this talk useful and enjoyable. Uh, so this talk is on nanopore sequencing of human genomes, uh, the long and short of it, and perhaps you'll see why uh, a little bit later on. Now, whilst I assume most of you have come across nanopore sequencers before, maybe you haven't. So this is a cartoon of a, a nanopore sequencer, an animation, uh, and it's showing the flow cell and it's showing the library here, which is DNA molecules with a motor protein and adapter sequence. Actually, it can be RNA as well. Uh, you load your sample onto the flow cell uh, and the flow cell consists of lots of wells, each of which contains a membrane at the center of that membrane is a single nanopore and that single nanopore is going to capture individual molecules uh, and as it captures those molecules uh, and they interface with the pore the DNA will start to process through the nanopore. Now a potential difference of voltage is applied across the pore uh, and that means a current flows as DNA passes through the nanopore and that current is proportional to the sequence that's present in the pore at any moment in time uh, and so you can infer the DNA sequence from the current trace as you can see illustrated here. Sequencing occurs at about 400 bases a second, 450 bases a second. This is an asynchronous system, you have multiple different channels that can sequence simultaneously and you can access the data from those channels as uh, the data are generated so you don't have to wait until the end of a sequencing run. Now with any new sequencing technology, there's always the question of can you sequence a human genome on a sequencing device? Uh, and in this case, the MinIron is a portable device, it's a handheld device, and so beg the to do this, and the answer was uh, yes, you can. Uh, this was published a couple of years ago now, the first sequencing uh, and assembly of a human genome uh, with nanopore data. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some special features of that, those data in a moment, um, but all of these data are freely available. There is a, an online GitHub where you can go and access the data. It contains RNA and cDNA as well now, so you can uh, look at all of these samples from this one NA12878 reference. One of the key things about this protocol uh, or about this paper was a protocol, the ultra long read protocol that enabled you to get reads of 100 KB or longer. Uh, and so that protocol is freely available and continues to be updated. Uh, and just at the end of last year, the RNA data for this paper, uh, for, for this uh, project were published as well. So all of those data are available for you to analyze. Now, the ultra long read protocol is something that I think is particularly interesting. There are two different ways, essentially, to make a nanopore library. Uh, the first is the ligation prep, uh, and this is uh, where you take DNA, you can shear it, fragment it, uh, you do an end prep, a ligation, uh, attach tethers and go ahead and sequence. And then there is a transposase method, uh, and this is a very quick method, about 10 minutes to go from DNA to loaded library. And in our original human work, we were exploring these in particular, my colleagues Josh Quick and Nick Bowman from the University of Birmingham were working on this, uh, and they spotted that you got a, a much longer read tail on the rapid library preps than you did on either ligation uh, by G-tube or ligation by shearing. And of course, that, that's clearly true. If you fragment your DNA and make the molecules shorter, you will get shorter reads. If you can lower the amount of fragmentation uh, and have longer molecules, you will get longer reads. And it looked as though the rapid kit gave you this. And it was Josh and Nick working together who uh, came up with this idea that you could take a standard rapid prep and you could make the reads even longer by effectively reducing the number of transpose events, transposase events into the DNA. Uh, and you could do that in one of two ways. You could dilute the amount of transposase, or as we did, uh, you could increase the amount of DNA. And so effectively, we overloaded uh, these uh, reactions with lots of DNA to reduce the effective number of cuts. Now, it's not good enough to just use any whole DNA here. Uh, if you want to get really long reads, you need to have very, very high quality DNA. Uh, it needs to be uh, have, uh, uh, needs to be very contiguous, and so your DNA extraction and library preparation is vital. 
Um, obviously, your read lengths are going to be proportional to the input DNA length. Short molecules will only ever give you short reads. Um, and you have to handle the DNA very carefully. And this is an observation made by Adam Philippi on the right hand side. If you were to scale the nanopore up to the size of a human fist, then a megabase of DNA is a rope 3.2 kilometers long. And clearly, that has to be handled carefully. Uh, otherwise, it'll get tangled, you'll get knots, you'll get uh, issues. Uh, Josh explored this method and using this approach was so if you go back to 2001, the human genome then, REF28, the NG50 uh, was about 0.5 megabases. Uh, I'm showing this uh, image on the left and where you see gray and black bands, those are individual contigs within that assembly. And if we take the data that we were able to generate in 2018 uh, and compare that assembly, we see that we were able to increase our assembly uh, contiguity to 6.4 uh, megabases. Now, actually, that uh, uh, assembly has been far surpassed now. Um, actually, by these data themselves, as you rebase call the data, you get higher quality reads, and so you can assemble uh, this better. Uh, but at the time, that was the most contiguous human assembly from a single technology ever uh, achieved. Uh, it included having the MHC assembled into a single contigs and being able to phase through those contigs for the first time. And all of the assembly work here was done by Sergey Koren and Adam Philippi. Now, one of the things about getting these long reads is that it motivated us to try and get more. So we were pushing for more reads. And if any of you follow me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is at Matt Luce. Uh, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me talking about whale watching. And whale watching is essentially this search for long reads. Uh, and we've established a long read club. It's on a little bit of a hiatus currently as we address other issues. But uh, we established a long read club. There's a YouTube channel and a Twitter account and, and all sorts of things there that I'd encourage you to look at. Uh, all towards uh, getting ever longer reads. But why did we talk about whale watching? Well, as we were getting longer and longer reads, we needed a way of understanding uh, what we meant by a uh, long. So we came up with the whale scale. And essentially what you do is convert the length of your read in kilobases to a weight in kilograms, uh, and then look for a whale of the equivalent size. And so the longest read we were able to get in our original human paper was 970 KB. That corresponds to a narwhale. Uh, if you could get to a megabase, that would be a short finned pilot whale. One and a half megabases is a beluga whale. Uh, and if you could get up to three megabases plus, these would be killer whale reads, and they'd actually equate to whole bacterial chromosomes. If you're wondering on the whale theme, all nanopore software is named after fish. Now, I know whales aren't fish. I'm not that bad a biologist, uh, but they swim. It's close enough, so we use whales. That 970 KB read set off a bit of a competition. And the competition was to see who could be the first person to get a megabase read. Uh, and that record went to a group in Australia uh, who were able to generate the first megabase read. Obviously, we were disappointed. We'd hoped to get that. It led to a little trophy, uh, the Ashes Trophy for whoever had the longest read. And that had been held by uh, my colleagues in Birmingham. It was about to be shipped to Australia and we thought that. Uh, and so we uh, achieved a read of uh, 1.4 megabases uh, in uh, February, I guess, 2018. I can't, I can't remember. Yes, 2018. Uh, and, and we found that read. And in fact, we went on to find the reads. Uh, and the longest read we have achieved to date is 2.272 megabases. Uh, there's a number of reads I'm showing you here. These are reads that you can see when mapped to the human genome. Uh, you, you can see where they are. You can see the kind of regions that they cover uh, on different chromosomes. Now, in fact, this read was made up of several smaller reads. The nanopore software would often uh, make errors in base calling, uh, sorry, not base calling, in, in deciding where one read ended and another started. Those have largely been resolved now, but we, we uncovered that by looking at these data in some detail. Sadly, earlier, our record went uh, and uh, 
a company in the US, Circulomics, uh, presented a 2.44 megabase read. Uh, it was a really great uh, accomplishment. All the fun of getting long reads aside, uh, and it's a lot of fun looking for these, uh, they do make a difference to our assemblies. I'm just going to show you here some information on, on the assemblies we got. Uh, if we take the best assembly that we've been able to achieve uh, from just short read, well, short uh, read data, not short read, but our 10 KB assembly, uh, that was about a three megabase N50. Uh, when we added our extra ultra long reads, we were able to increase that to 6.4, as I've told you. And in fact, with uh, better improvements in, in base calling and, and analysis, uh, we got that up to 12.4 megabases with Canoe. Uh, going further uh, by taking just the best 30x data that we have to date. Uh, so our top sliced longest data set, just 30x of it, we're able to get a, an NG50 of 36.5 megabases uh, and separate that into uh, paternal and maternal uh, genomes as well. So these long reads are fun, but they also massively improve assemblies. Um, other groups have taken up on this and followed up with this. Uh, and there was a preprint last year from Karen Meager uh, and Adam Philippi and the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. Uh, and this is working with CHM13, uh, a haploid uh, human cell line. Uh, and they were able to generate 70x PAP bio data and 35x of these ultra long ONT reads. Uh, and the assembly I'm showing here has a NG50 uh, of 75 megabases and was the most contiguous, uh, is the most contiguous human genome uh, to date. And in fact, uh, they've been able to finish the X chromosome. Uh, so there's a complete X chromosome and more to follow. So there's a lot that you can do using uh, Nanopore technology. There was a fantastic preprint last year uh, from Decode in Iceland. And this just shows how you can scale up human sequencing uh, on a Promethean. So a Promethean is a, a larger Nanopore platform able to sequence 48 flow cells simultaneously. Uh, they are larger flow cells than the standard min-ion flow cells. Uh, so this is uh, 1,817 Icelandic genomes uh, sequenced and analysed, uh, all with long reads. It's a truly remarkable paper, uh, and I suggest you have a look at it if you're interested in that. But all this does beg a question. What if you don't need an entire genome? Uh, what if it's sufficient to have just regions of a genome uh, and to have targeted panels? So the number of people have been working on this in different ways. Nanopore have a number of different approaches and have shown a number of different approaches over the years for uh, capturing different regions of the DNA. So there was a CRISPR catch method where you isolate uh, DNA in agarose plugs. You use Cas9 to uh, cut and you retrieve uh, the fragment of interest uh, using a pulse field gel electrophoresis and then go ahead and sequence it. Uh, that's the CRISPR-Catch method. Uh, then there was a DCAS9 pull-down method where you use a, a dead Cas9 to pull down and capture uh, molecules of interest and sequence those. Um, but the most efficient method that I've, I've seen from Nanopore uh, for this type of approach is a Cas9 cut method. And here what you use is guide RNAs which are going to cut your DNA. So you take DNA, you shear it, you protect the ends such that you can't ligate anything to them. Uh, you then use Cas9 to cut the DNA at your sites of interest, uh, and you can ligate then sequencing adapters onto those cut sites uh, and just sequence the molecules that you're interested in. And this is a great uh, approach uh, for targeted sequencing. And there was a lovely preprint last year from uh, Timothy Gilpatrick and colleagues, uh, which showed this method for Cas9 for capturing uh, specific regions of the human genome and for looking at methylation, uh, for capturing structural variants uh, and looking at mutations. And, and we had been working on this uh, as well a little bit, uh, and we showed this working on the Flongal. So the Flongal is an adapter for your min-ion, 
Uh, so it's a dongle for your min iron, but it lets you put a flow cell in there, slightly smaller flow cell. And we were able to get 62x mean coverage across 10 targets in the human genome, which is effectively 2000x enrichment over background. It's a very nice way of capturing specific targets. But there is another way that you can capture specific molecules on a nanopore sequencer. So this is another video from Nanopore uh, that was released earlier this year in response to a couple of papers. Uh, and in essence, this is describing a method that we first showed in 2016. Uh, this method or this approach tries to remove any requirement for sample, for sample preparation uh, and instead allows you to select individual molecules on the sequencer. So how does this work? Well, as the sequencer is capturing a molecule and the molecule is flowing through the pore, you can get the current trace from it in real time. And if you can analyze that current trace quickly enough, you can decide whether that molecule comes from a region of the genome you're interested in or not. And if it doesn't, you can eject that molecule by reversing the voltage. So you can sample new molecules from the nanopore. Uh, and this approach is uh, uh, possible and it, it allows you to choose the molecules that you're going to sequence. Uh, so this molecule, for example, is one that you want and so you allow it to keep sequencing. So in principle, you have this method of control, but you have to have a way of choosing your molecules. Now, when we showed this working in 2016, Um, we did this uh, very simply using an algorithm called dynamic time warping. Uh, dynamic time warping uh, is being used for many different things. It just is a way of allowing you to compare two signals with one another. This is just showing uh, how we were able to capture two regions from the lambda genome, two 5 kb regions from a 48 kb genome, uh, and we could capture them or uh, on on demand uh, from sequencing from a library. Uh, and it worked, it really did work. But there was a problem. Um, the problem was that there was a lot of hidden compute. Uh, in order for us to capture those two 5 kb regions of the lambda genome, we had to use 22 cores of a CPU running constantly uh, to process the data fast enough. You're capturing from 512 individual channels simultaneously, analyzing the data and sending a message back to the sequencer before the the molecule is finished passing through the nanopore, otherwise there's no benefit. So it was using a lot of compute and we needed a more efficient and effective way of doing this. So we've been working for the last few years with this uh, and just in February, um, goodness me, it doesn't seem like that long ago, uh, a paper, uh, we put a paper out on BioArchive uh, that demonstrates this method working. Um, and it led to a fair amount of interest on Twitter. Uh, this is a message from a colleague of mine um, who said, pushing forward a great idea and justifying purchase of high-end gaming PCs in research labs uh, the world over. And why is he referencing high-end PCs? Well, the method we use uh, is relies on real-time base calling. It relies on the ability to convert that current trace to bases very, very quickly, and that relies on GPUs, relies on the graphical processing units that you find in, in computers to play games with. Sadly, our computer doesn't look like this one. We weren't allowed to buy a fancy gaming rig. Nanopore do make a product which matches uh, those requirements. It's called the Gridiron. The Gridiron allows you to sequence from up to five positions simultaneously, uh, and it has a very powerful GPU uh, that gives you live base calling. And we were able to exploit that GPU for the experiments I'm going to show you here. I should point out that you don't require that much of a powerful GPU. You can use a, a less powerful GPU. We have used one, a 1080 G, uh, from NVIDIA 1080 GPU, which is probably five years old now. Uh, and, and that's sufficient to make this work. But currently, our software that we use to do this works only on Linux. It requires a specific version of the base caller, uh, and it does require a GPU. <coughs> now, what can you do with this? 
Well, this is a, an illustration and, and Alex Payne, a PhD student in the lab, has built a really nice package to allow us to do all of this. Uh, this illustration shows a single flow cell. If you look in the top right hand corner of the screen, you have a heat map with four different regions. Uh, these are four different regions of the same flow cell, so we've divided it up computationally and we're doing four different things. In the first region, we're sequencing everything that passes through the flow cell. In the second region, we're sequencing just 50% of the molecules, uh, and that corresponds to chromosomes 1 to 8. We're looking at the human genome here. Uh, the next region along, we're sequencing 25%, chromosomes 19 to 14, uh, and in the final region, about 12%. That corresponds to chromosomes 16 to 20. On the left, I'm showing you the median read lengths, uh, and you can see in our control region, all of the read lengths for each chromosome, the median read lengths are about the same, around 12 kb, with the exception of the mitochondria, which is a bit shorter. Uh, where we're sequencing just chromosomes 1 to 8, you can see just chromosomes 1 to 8 along. Everything else is now short. It's the same library. It's the same flow cell. It's just that we're doing different things uh, on each channel. Uh, we're controlling what's happening. Uh, the next region, uh, we're seeing chromosomes 9 to 14, and in the final region, 16 to 20. Uh, so we're able to choose which chromosomes get sequenced. But how much enrichment do we expect to see? Uh, well, we expect to see if we're selecting just two, uh, just 50 percent of the material, the, the highest enrichment we can have is twofold. Actually, we only get about one and a half fold. If we are selecting a quarter of the genome, the highest enrichment we can see is fourfold and we get almost twofold. Uh, and if we're selecting uh, 12 percent, then the highest enrichment we can get is about eightfold. And actually, we only just get over twofold. So what's happening? What's the problem? Uh, well, you can see the problem actually in the heat map on the top right hand side. The, the heat map corresponds to the uh, number of bases that have been sequenced by each pore. And you can see that where we're rejecting more reads, so where we're sequencing less of the sample, uh, we overall sequence less bases than where we sequence everything. And this is in part due to a phenomenon called blocking, uh, where DNA gets tangled in the pore. Fortunately, Nanopore do have a solution to that, uh, and that's to wash the surface of your flow cell every once in a while with nuclease uh, to degrade these blocked regions, and then you can carry on sequencing. Um, but ideally, we would like to see no blocking uh, in the future. That would give us much, much better enrichment. The question is, what can you do with this? But well, once we realized that we could select individual chromosomes, we thought, well, how targeted can we get? Uh, and so we decided to try and capture uh, every exon in the human genome. In order to do that, we built a targets. Uh, those targets were essentially all the exons, but we decided to enrich uh, for coverage uh, on odd numbered chromosomes and to deplete on even numbered chromosomes for every exon. There's a about 25,000 targets here. Uh, we did various things to collapse adjacent targets together, etc., uh, etc. Et um, but what we end up with uh, is a mean coverage uh, of just over 20x for uh, all of these targets on a single flow cell. Uh, now, on a single flow cell, you would expect to get maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, gigabases, and that's the lower two of these dashed lines. So you can see we're getting quite a significant enrichment of these targets. We did note that within the exons, of course, are lots of genes of interest for things like cancer. Uh, so here is uh, in panel B, I'm showing the exon targets from the cosmic panel. In other words, these are the 717 odd genes that are labeled as being having significant uh, somatic mutations in cancer. Uh, and so we would hope we'd be able to look at these and do something uh, with them. To illustrate, you see here, here are some plots showing coverage over a couple of genes. Uh, on the left, we're looking at BRCA1. On the right, we're looking at PML1. Uh, and you can see we're enriching for coverage over those genes. Uh, and between those genes, uh, we are seeing uh, lower coverage. And in fact, between the exons, so in PML1, uh, maybe you can see there's this low area of decreased coverage, and that's because it's intronic and we weren't capturing intronic sequence here. Once we realized these exon panels worked, we decided to move to 
panels uh, in is a, a general rule to have a look at cancer panels. Uh, so we uh, rebuilt our probe strategy. And this probe strategy is simply writing a, a file on a computer to say which regions of the genome you want to capture. Uh, and we decided to include the introns as well as the exons. So we're now capturing whole genic regions. Uh, and again, we focused on this cosmic panel. And here you can see uh, in a typical run on slightly fewer targets, again, 717, uh, we're at an, a mean coverage of just over 30x for every single one uh, of these targets. Uh, and I'm showing you BRCA1 and PML uh, again, and you can see we get really nice coverage. So this would allow us to do all the things that you can do with nanopore sequencing, such as methylation calling, uh, calling SNPs, uh, and looking for structural variants. And of course, that's an obvious thing to do with this type of approach. Uh, and so we go on to look in a cell line, the NB4 cell line. Uh, the NB4 cell line has a known translocation between PML and RARA. And you can see in this experiment, we only sequenced for 15 hours. We were interested in the time to turn around, the speed at which we could we could look at this. Uh, and in 15 hours, we were able to detect and precisely identify the location of that translocation. So we had six reads that spanned from PML to RARA uh, that we captured and could see. Uh, on the right here, I'm showing any 12878 uh, control. Uh, so there were no reads obviously detected. I want to highlight another very similar uh, and they showed that you could do methylation calling they've used a slightly different method it's really neat it's all based in signal space and uh, this is the work of sam kavaka et al that came out on uh, bioarchive at the same time as our paper did so so please do go and have a look at that um so quickly to wrap up nanopore sequencing is extremely scalable it's uh, easily deployable in lots of different locations uh, we're seeing that right now in the midst of the covid19 outbreak Bioinformatics is getting easier. Uh, Real-time GPU-based calling is transformative. It lets us do some of these really cool targeted sequencing approaches I've just been talking about. You get methylation data for free. Targeted sequencing is relatively straightforward. It just requires a bed file. We can dynamically target regions of genomes. We can modify targets on the fly. Uh, and we've even shown that you can do targeted sequencing uh, of regions like the HLA, though I didn't talk about that today. So I shall wrap up. Uh, some thank yous to all of my collaborators. Thank you for listening, and I think I'll be able to take some questions. Uh, the audience, and uh, that's why I, I will start with just summarizing some of them. So um, the basic question is: this is also a clinical audience. Um, so uh, uh, is it going? Is this kind of sequencing being done in the clinic somewhere? And um, how long would this take, like a single run? And can you also comment on the costs? Uh, a single run. So if you wanted to do a single run to get a whole genome, a whole human genome, uh, you would need to run on Promethean. That would be about 48 to 60 hours uh, to get 30x coverage. Um, mm -hmm. Cost of that, you're looking at around, uh, it depends on scale. Uh, and the numbers you're doing, but between 1,200 to 2,000 pounds for a genome. So uh, you have to do a lot to, to get that um, to get that price down. There are organisations I, I mentioned that Decode are doing a lot of sequencing at this scale. Um, I'm aware of several other organisations that are starting to do this. The targeted sequencing I mentioned right at the end there, if you're looking for structural variants, you, you mm -hmm. can get an answer within 24 hours. Um, for, for looking for structural variants. Um, and those are using smaller flow cells. They're a bit cheaper. You can probably get that down to about 400 pounds. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the kind of range. Cool. And uh, related to that, I mean, in the human genetics field, everyone cares about accuracy. And can you comment like on the single nucleotide level a little bit uh, on that? And, and also um, the difficult regions of the genomes, right? Because people, we were all very impressed by your super long reads, um, but what about repeats and uh, like different chromatin status? Does it influence um, the, the, the length of the reads? Yeah, there's a lot of great questions in there. So um, nanopore sequencing accuracy is continually improving. Um, we are probably at about 98% single molecule accuracy at present, but consensus accuracy is a lot higher than that. Uh, and you should you should always be looking at consensus accuracy and you should always be polishing uh, reads using the various tools that are available. 
Um, you asked about repeats. I think repeats are one of the regions where these very long reads are crucial. Um, and to be able to span complex repeats in very long centromeric regions, for example, might, might require single reads um, to really unambiguously place uh, all of the repeats there. Whether, whether chromatin structure makes a big difference to the way the molecules sequence, I, I suspect there's quite a lot in uh, there's quite a lot in chromatin structure that will influence sequencing of the molecule and that's something that we're going to get into as we can see more and more of these regions of the genome that, that we haven't been able to access before. Okay and the very last question um, so uh, it's a mean one so if you uh, um, now have a lab or a clinic uh, what would you recommend? So should people, some people will walk around and say, go for PEC bio, this will be the answer to everything, or go for a nanopore, what would you recommend? To them? So I actually think you have to use the correct tool to answer the question you're interested in. If you want to look at uh, lots of uh, lots of genomes um, and you have infinite money, then you can take your, your pick. Um, but yeah, I think you have to use the right tool for the right job. Um, the new hi-fi reads look really interesting. Um, mm. uh, how scalable up they are to looking at lots of genomes is, is, is a challenge. So it's all about picking the tool that you need uh, for the question you're trying to address. Just the scientists. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, for this incredible talk. And you're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the ECHG. And I uh, posted your Twitter handle, so I hope everyone follows you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Martin, take it away. Thank you again. So our next speaker is going to be Douglas Fowler. Uh, he's an associate professor at genome sciences and the bioengineering department of the University of Washington, Seattle. Doug is a leader in high throughput sequencing based assays and his lab has, a, has deep expertise in uh, large scale uh, experiments like deep mutational scanning. We're looking forward to his talk. <laughs>